Stanford University. Be able to get a degree just taking 101. Um, good afternoon. Welcome to E 380 Next week is Jane McGonigal, um, whose thesis is basically invent the future by playing a game, a multiplayer online game with forecasting. And I'm not sure how this is all going to work. So that's why we're doing it. The uh, week after is the second in our MIT series. Carl Hewitt will talk about scalable, scalable privacy-friendly cloud computing. Um, and my comment is, what could go wrong with that? Um, October 29th is still a mystery, and it's not that we're keeping it from you. Well, if we are keeping it from you, we're keeping it from me, too. November 5th is Guido von Rossum talking about Google Act Engine. You still have time to make your great application before then. November 12th, Al Fazio, I believe, from Intel, is going to talk about memory. And those of us who like fast computers are starting, well, I've been mad at the memory people for some time. So hopefully he will come here and deliver wonderfulness. Um, beyond that, I didn't actually bring the, uh, the speakers. They're the ones that have been confirmed are on the 380 website. Um, Ted. Selker, today's speaker, is the first of our MIT speakers. He comes with, some, with three of the best known brands in computer science. MIT Media Lab, IBM Fellow, Park, cool stuff. Um, much of the work that, all of the, that the rest of us do is concerned with making computers work. I don't know what the right verb is here, but Ted doesn't. He works on making computers work for people, which, to be honest, is a better problem. However, today is not uh, in that topic, but a much more timely topic. Um, in fact, today's talk is perhaps the most economic talk of the last couple of years. Why? Because the market, because the economic system is having some troubles. 
and those of you who pay attention to this sort of thing know that now is absolutely the best time to try to do something to start a business if you can somehow fund yourself via spouses, friends, family, stealing cans out of my recycling, whatever it is. Because assuming everything doesn't go to hell, when we pop out the other end, you'll be positioned greatly. And if everything does go to hell, you had a great time in the meantime. So with that, Dr. Selker. So <clears throat> great to be here. Um, recognize a couple people. Um, so I'm a hopeless inventor. You guys probably know a little bit about that. If you don't, I'll say a couple words, but I'm not going to talk so much about the things that I, I build today as, as, as um, well, maybe the idea of how to take inventions to become, uh, to become valuable to the world. Um, the invent, there's a, like, you know, a, lot of, a lot of violins played by inventors or would-be inventors and and even, even inside of companies. And uh, the question is, is it because it, it has to be so that, that innovation is difficult to, to take forward? Or is it because we haven't really invented the best ways of doing it? Um, and there's been lots of cycles. But, so I'm going to talk today about some of the trade-offs and some of the ways that, that, business, uh, that ideas uh, go, to, go, to, go, go to market. Um, some of the ways that they're funded, early stage business development uh, has, has quite a legacy of approaches. And we'll talk about these various approaches of, of taking new technology uh, forward. And uh, I'll sprinkle it with some of, the, some of the stuff that I'm known for, but not so much. Um, and I, I have this dream right now called the Generator Fund. Uh, and the Generator Fund is, is, is going to be the, 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 the take home message at the end of the day, which is that the idea is going to be to make some sort of a system whereby the ideas are competing with each other, the people to take them forward are competing to be the people that should take them forward, and in that way there's lots of chances for success and that we aren't spending our time fighting about whether we're going to be able to, to, to get enough money to go forward another 25 minutes, but rather we're trying to make sure that we are the best of the, of the several different approaches that are, that are going to take this idea forward. So um, uh, I have this idea of a funnel of, of bringing resources in and finally going to that bright white place in the sky that's so beautiful. Um, and uh, um, let's just um, uh, give you a little background on me. Um, I was um, at IBM where I ran a user system ergonomics research uh, group. It's still down there in Almaden. Um, and had uh, research uh, endeavors in <coughs> um, physical user interface, graphical user interface, and cognitive user interface. Some of the things that I'm known from, from that are uh, this blue thing that you don't know as much about is um, I made a 30 times performance improvement for uh, all vector operations on, on the PowerPC, which made it be able to be competitive with the alpha and, the, and, 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 other, and other things. And what's fun about that, that story is that it actually uh, was um, making that tool that, that made this, this visualization showed that um, this one was a different shape than all those other ones, and that's the bottleneck. Uh, and it, in fact, changed the, the, the architecture of the PowerPC. There were several things that were interesting about that, that visualization that made, that made it possible for people to, to take things about thrashing that they already knew and realize that they were systematically uh, applying thrashing to the best compilers in the world, they thought. Um, but what people are more you know, used to hearing me talk about are things like adaptive help systems that went into the OS2 operating system, or the pointing device, and lots of other um, things that went into the ThinkPad, the, the, the setup thing. And, and, and a lot of the innovation in, in the ThinkPad was a lot of fun to develop. Um, and all that stuff was a lot of fun. But, you'll, but the thing that's very um, interesting about all of those things is that they, um, they are uh, things that were fit into a system that already existed. The OS2 uh, operating system. The ThinkPad existed. It wasn't profitable until we put the pointing device in it. But it was, it was, it was a, a, a lovely, a lovely uh, uh, product that didn't make money. Um, but, and, so, and so you take in a big company and what you really want to do is you want to take what they are doing and make it successful. Right. A big company exists because it has a revenue stream. 
right? The revenue stream exists because customers expect them to be producing something. They expect the customers to get something. They have, you know, everybody knows to go to them for this stuff or whatever, and they think of them as being a reliable place. You know, if IBM would only make a good notebook computer, people might buy it and all that. But, um, <clears throat> and so when you're doing innovation inside of that kind of an organization, you do stuff like, like you know, you figure out that you can make a pointing device that for typing and, uh, and, for, and selection, that is editing, you are, you know, 20, 30 percent faster than even a mouse, okay? That makes a difference because then people love it and then they write about it and everyone buys this product. And, and that's, a, that's a little change to the product line. And, and, and you know, that it, it was a lot of fun to do that kind of thing, but it's not where our heart as visionaries or as, as, as hopeful <laughs> visionaries lies. Our, our, our heart li lies in making huge changes, difference, differences that will change, you know, the paradigms of how we work. And I struggle with this because when you change something that people expected and, and, and knew was going to, you know, be there like an IBM to buy computers, then, you know, all, every, 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 you know, every spaceman uh, for, for, for a decade used the ThinkPad, right? You know, the, the mouse didn't float away and, you know, there's a, there are various good things about it. And, um, and, and I, you know, was pretty proud, proud of that. But um, it's really quite different from, from generating a whole new uh, field. And so, you know, when I was, um, so when, when I was, uh, oh, and I'll, yeah, I'll just, I'll stop on that one. Yeah, that, that was a fine slide. I don't know why I passed it up. Uh, hang on. How do I go backwards? Yeah, so, so um, you know, kind of, kind of uh, you know, this is the line of things I learned while, while making, you know, dozens of products at IBM. I learned that, you know, you know, you got this long list of things you got to do. You got to, you got to have, you know, a, an idea, a vision, and then you, then you get, you know, some, 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 some instantiation of it. We call it a design, and then we, you know, we, we, we communicated to somebody, maybe with a white paper or, or a PowerPoint deck, and then we, then we like make some mock-ups, you know, and I often am making them with clay and cardboard or, or you know, flash or something, and, and then we do some user testing. Does somebody like it? Do we, and you know, a lot of the time you kind of pretend it works and see if they can go through that scenario, and then, then you like get, get some users and, and you see if they, you know, uh, whether, whether, whether they really, you know, they can not only can, can use it, but they would want it. And, and then you do some prototyping and manufacturing, and then, then you get, after you get the manufacturing, you try to get people to, to love it. And, and, and you know, what's amazing is on the day of announcement of the ThinkPad, okay, I happened to be allowed to be there. And I went over and I played with a bunch of them. And I found out that a third of them didn't work. Okay. Now, it, the marketing guys, they were all suited up and walking around looking really good. And they, they didn't bother to try them, right? But, you know, I took those ones off. You know, went back in the back room, called my friends and, it, you know, the engineering. We found out that, you know, it was because there was a, they put in an extra, uh, a capacitor that was a little, had a little lag time, which made the bisection search not settle before they went on to the next phase of it. So it'd get, it'd get pigeonholed into the wrong place in the, in the, in the, in the calibration phase, and then it'd go fast to the left and, and slow to the right. Okay, so that kind of problem, right, those kind of problems happen at that stage. You know what? At every stage you have those kind of problems. These problems where communicating your idea, somebody tried to improve it, and they, weren't, and they didn't understand enough about it, or you thought it was perfect and walked away before you did the final little things. I mean, I could tell you 10 examples like that. Um, and you know, then you have the splash, and everybody loved this thing. In fact, within a week, all of the rubber tops were crumbling. They were crumbling because they were made out of a plastic impregnated with rubber, I had anticipated that that was a bad top, and I'd started making a tool 12 weeks earlier over everyone's dead body, and it was ready just in time for them to put a nice sticky, uh, expensive top on, a rubber top on, which, which, had, which, which uh, was also relieved a lot of pressure on the finger, blah, 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 blah. But I'm just saying that kind of thing after the splash was very important to make the splash hold. Differentiability, what is different about this one than the other ones? Of course, you know, what's really interesting to me is that the track ball that was on the thumb position for the, for the Apple back in 1991, 92, they had our thumb ball. If you used your finger instead of your thumb, now if you used your thumb instead of your finger on that thing, you could save almost a second of going back to the keyboard. And you could really, really do a lot better than any of the pads of today. And people never did. 
I videotaped and showed that no one used their, their thumb, and that was one of the ways that I was able to, to show that we were going to have a differentiation. Because it turns out the trackball, it's got its problems, but it's got some, some, some good things too. Uh, the sales, right? The, the, after you have the sales, you have the returns, right? Um, and uh, those can destroy whatever success you had. You have the marketplace acceptance. I mean, there are so many movies about, you know, it makes everyone's cro eyes cross eyes afterwards. And then you have the market size, you have the warranty problems. You know, uh, there was a time for a couple of years where, where one of the manufacturers, uh, it wasn't IBM, uh, had some thin film transistors that evaporated off of, the, off of the glass after about six months. Okay, no one remembers that. People that were on the inside remember that. That was a billion dollar mistake, right? And, and you know, and, uh, you know, made, you know, and some companies go out of business and during those kind of, during those kind of problems. Um, recall problems. You know, IBM made the fantastic uh, notebook that, that ran on, uh, um, it was a the ThinkPad 500. It had lead-acid batteries. It was going to save, maybe a lot cheaper. It was going to be, have all sorts of blah, 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 blah. Well, they started leaking, right? Leaking acid isn't a good thing, and you never heard about that. Most of you guys never heard about a ThinkPad 500. Um, and so, you know, the profitability is, is of course, a matter of whether you're uh, charging more, as much as you cost. Ever, how many people remember the butterfly keyboard? Okay, and how many of you think that was a great thing? Okay, well let me tell you that it was thicker and heavier than anything it competed with because of that mechanism. That it came out nine months late because of that mechanism. It had uh, ha uh, half the speed of processor, half the battery life of its competitors, and it cost IBM um, several hundred dollars more than they charged. So that, that, that particular item in nine months lost uh, 100 million dollars. So that's just an example of, of how you might think that something's being a success, but in the end, the profitability uh, is, is an issue. Another thing about that particular product I happen to dislike for various reasons of personality um, uh, is, is uh, extensibility. The reason for that product was it could, make it, it could make it squat. But the fact is displays were getting big. So there wasn't any need to have a, a squishing keyboard when the display was big as, as, as a normal QWERTY keyboard. And so, in fact, the, the, the goal and longevity of that particular invention was, was very limited, was one, 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 one uh, cycle. Follow-ons, uh, again, is, 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 is what we're talking about there. So anyway, there's lots and lots of things that happen. I'm not saying that that's the full list. I'm just saying that the list of, of things that take things forward is, 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 is complex, and many of us that, that live in the, in the R&D space think, uh, think of uh, only, gosh, if I had a great idea, everyone would come and buy it. Um, and so I, I like to think of, uh, you know, speech reco. Is that a technology? I call it a technique. A technology is when something fits into a scenario and works, right? A technique, you know, one of the most important things about recognizing speech might be feedback, right? And, and if you have feedback, then you can recognize speech, right? As opposed to rec a nice speech. And so, um, you know, it's very difficult. We are ambiguous in our, in our communications. If we're talking about understanding communications, then we have to figure out how we're disambiguating it. Is it with AI? Of course we try to understand as much as we can and we model what a person's saying and we figure out, but my wife still makes these incredible miscalculations of what I've just said to her. And, you know, where, where she just misparses a sentence and, you know, and she's pretty smart. So I bet it happens to other people too. Um, and so then the, the question of uh, technologies cr creating uh, products is you have to have something that really has a scenario around it that really solves you know, a problem. You hear these solve a problem things, but basically the question is where is something brittle? Everything breaks in some situations. Uh, and I always like to say that you know, um, uh, a product uh, is the product plus the instruction manual. The instruction manual is all the things that they didn't build into it that you have to know to make it work. Um, you know, I don't know why when I twist this pen, it doesn't, the, the tip doesn't come out. Right? How, can somebody help me with that? You know, and then, and then right, and if I pull that, it just, you know, it doesn't open it either. You know, it's so easy. I can take this, this thing on the back off. There. No tip. Oh, darn it. <laughs> so anyway, it's very easy not to understand things and uh, designing things so that they look like something that you are expecting, something you've seen, or, or that there's some instructions or some graphics or some, or, or some ergonomic things that guide you to succeed or correspond. Um, problem. Then products create companies. Products create companies only uh, um, <clears throat> uh, if, 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 of course, they, they, they make money so that the organization can thrive. 
Okay, so these are all sorts of things that I made at IBM that didn't turn into product. Okay, and they're all my favorite things, right? This, this, we, we had an eye tracking setup, structured eye, that, that basically, if you glanced at an article, it could tell whether you're glancing or gazing, and if you're gazing, it could tell and pop it up and give you the article, and it could do that in a third of a second. Okay, it takes a second uh, to, to actually move a mouse over there. So it was faster than a mouse can move. And that's kind of, that's kind of exciting. We had, we, uh, um, uh, I, made, I made that wallet up there that could, uh, that, that could have a chameleon, uh, this is 12, 13 years ago, uh, could have a chameleon credit card that could be a MasterCard or American Express or whatever. It was a four ounce cell phone that could also, you know, gosh, it had the internet on it. You know, I made all these things, you know, I made a living room, the smart living room. I made lots and lots of stuff that was so lovely, and IBM loved it. And they loved it so much, they'd send me to the Olympics, and they'd send me to Wall Street to give talks. Why? Because companies must have a, a standing uh, in Wall Street of, being, uh, of looking like they're competent. What's competent means? That means they see where things are going, right? They have to look to investors. Uh, like they, they're looking around the corners, they have to, for themselves, do forecasting by, by predicting the future. And it's really good to have all of these techni technologies laying around so you are seeing what it is. And also the prowess of somebody that does that brings in other people. It's great to be, have, it's a good, good thing to hire great engineers. So you're trying to hire engineers. And the fourth thing on that list is probably making products. And it's usually not the goal to make disruptive products. The goal for a company is to continue with a revenue stream. And so a lot of these things, you know, stayed on the shelf, you know, room with a view, virtual, ah, lots of great stuff we could talk about. We can come back to it if you ever want. You know, there, there's, there's a laptop that you could throw around and, you know, and, and, and stand on and stuff and it wouldn't break. And, oh, I wanted to make that. Um, and so I, so I came to, uh, to the Media Lab. And at the Media Lab, I, I've spent the last 10 years running a group called Context Aware Computing, trying to demonstrate, because over the last you know, several decades, people have said AI can't work in the real world. I wanted to say that I can recognize and respect human intention in natural, even in dangerous settings. And so by, by uh, building in a lot of different domains um, things that use dynamic models of user system and, and task, uh, that would be able to do better than without them. I was trying to demonstrate that, um, you know, that a world could use um, the new technologies of, 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 of AI, of search, of computers, with the old technologies of design that are around things like, you know, physical look and, and, and ergonomics and, 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 and uh, mechanical function, um, together to make a design that would be more, more, more rich. Because I, I think that so much of the design that we do, industrial design, product design, I mean, something like this, it's clear because, well, that helps me know that there's water in it. And, you know, I don't expect it to be hot because, well, if it was hot, it would be big and thick and maybe have a handle on it. The handle is a device that makes me able not to touch the part of it that's hot. So these context-aware uh, things uh, of, in the physical world have been very prevalent for forever. However, uh, understanding how to evaluate those things and integrate technology and, and, uh, and, um, and, and the physical things is not something that the industrial design or product design world is very good at. A lot of rap, oh well. Um, so I, you know, basically, just to give you an example, that, that car up on the top is called Car Coach. And Car Coach, you drive in your car, we, had, we, we, we made a concept car with Chrysler. We had 209 sensors. We had three cameras in it, radars, CO detectors, everything. We had audio spotlights. I turned all of this stuff off. And I just said, what can I know that can improve a person's driving without changing anything about the car? So off of the CAN2 uh, bus, that's the communications bus inside the cabin, um, I, I, I listened to brakes, gas, steering, blinkers, um, speed, yeah, that's it. And uh, I left the cup holder attached because it's... See, when, the, when you take the cup out of the cup holder, it's not a good time to tell you that you're, that you're doing something wrong. In fact, when is it good to tell a person that they're doing something wrong as they're driving? So we experimented with that and, you know, we sure, sure as heck did some machine learning and found out that we could tell whether you're steering <coughs> um, 
steering uh, like you were drunk or steering like you were falling asleep. It's not that hard to do. We could actually tell by turning radius and speed whether you should have your blinkers on pretty well. But when we told people all of the mistakes they were making, the press loved it. And regular drivers did worse. If we used a variable schedule of reinforcement in which we gave more positive than negative uh, comments, we improved people's driving right away. Okay, you know, statistically significant, blah, blah, blah. So I'm very excited, proud of it, because you know what yeah, this thing ends up taking? This thing's, you know, a couple dollars worth of a processor, right? A sound chip, a one dollar sound chip. So that's the kind of work I've done. This is a smart helmet. We're not going to go into more detail until we get bored with the, the reason we came here. But here, this, this helmet, see if you're, if you're turning left or you're turning right, it puts on blinkers. And, and if I, okay, uh, you're not going to hear, I turned off the alarm. There's a 130 decibel alarm that goes off if I yell inside it. And there's a Bluetooth uh, headset. I wore it on the way over here. It's got, there's the MP3 input. And it turns that off and, and amplifies the outside noise if it's loud outside. So those are the kind of things that I made, you know, just kind of mediating the, the, the communication from inside and outside environment to make you more aware of your environment and them more aware of you. Okay. So lots of fun. Thought all the big companies would take it. Did they? Not only was it worse because I was sitting there with my job to do stuff that's outrageous, right? You know, Media Lab is supposed to be outrageous. But you're outside the company, as opposed to at IBM where I was inside the company. And these companies, why are they part of the Media Lab? They're part of the Media Lab because they have the problem, right? They have the problem that they aren't being as innovative as they want to be. So they come to the Media Lab to see innovation. Now, what's good? What's good is they still get to see around the cor corners, right? They get to make Wall Street think that they're being innovative. Those are good. They get to recruit people and get that stuff. But they don't really make the good new products. Well, that's fine because no one does anyway. On the other hand, as, as a professor, um, you know, caring about my job, I made, you know, almost 50 different research platforms. And um, yeah, you know, I mean, it, companies loved it. Some of them tried to license parts of them, but you know, all the little things. <laughs> And so I say we have companies no longer dominating the creative research space. Um, we have two major problems. One is that there's the innovator's dilemma. And I've been talking about that for the last 10 minutes. Um, and <clears throat> the, the point being that basically um, it's, you know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of reasons that um, the uh, um, stuff inside that's, that's trying to change things about the company are trying to change. The power in a company uh, always resides at the place where the money's coming in. And those guys are chosen to keep the things working that are there. And so something different is different. And it takes money away from their development project and blah, 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 blah. So there's lots of problems with that, 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 that are called the innovator's dilemma. Silicon Valley kind of incentives don't really exist inside of companies. It's very difficult for a company to figure out how to treat somebody that's doing something that's going to become successful uh, uh, in a way that they will um, uh, do, do very well if it does well. Uh, I, you know, and I've, I've seen it from both sides. When I was, you know, you know a, an IBM fellow, the first thing that happened when I came out of, out of the, the room where they, were, where they were anointing me an IBM fellow is somebody that didn't get to be an IBM fellow said, I don't know why they made you one of those things. Why didn't they make me a fellow in front of my wife, his wife? You know, it was really a lovely moment. And, and you know, so, so the jealousies of being inside of an organization and playing that zero-sum game are, are, are unfortunate. I mean, I, you know, I tried to say, gosh, you know, I mean, what, what, am I, what, am I, what do you say to the guy? You know, I, I slapped him. Um, but anyway, <laughs> no. um, but, you know, it, it just it didn't make the, the moment better. Um, so today's innovation uh, is, is happening outside of companies. And what, what's really started happening is companies have figured out that they don't know how to test ideas well enough to know whether it's going to be the $100 million business next year that's going to be the billion dollar one the year after. So what they do is if they have some cash around, not to this week, but when they have cash around, they say, we've got a strategy and it's uh, adjacent areas. Yeah, that'll be a typical thing they say. Or, or it's a deepening. You know, that's another thing they sometimes say. And so they say, who's doing that? And they find one of those and they say, I'll buy that. 
right? And then they have the two things together, right? And you know, GE kicks ass doing that. People say Cisco does great doing that. I don't know, Adobe, I'm, so, I'm told all but two of their products came to them that way. Maybe, I don't know. But the point being that acquisitions are an easier decision because they come with all of that machinery around them that everybody's comfortable with. They've got the revenue stream, they've got the management, they, and all that good stuff. So, so that's kind of, uh, that's kind of a, a, a more normal um, thing. And so what, what, what's, what's, what, what I'm going to talk about today is how does something get to that position where it can be acquired or IPO in a professionalized early, um, <clears throat> uh, early um, what do you call it, early technology startup uh, kind, of, kind of format. And, um, and, and what, I, what I'm going to say, and I'm sure all the VCs in the crowd are going to be mad at me for saying this, but I still love you, so it's all right, um, is uh, today uh, is that VCs and angels uh, uh, really want uh, a working uh, technology team with a customer. So that, 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 that means that they are not asking somebody to try new, something new. They're trying to celebrate somebody succeeding. Okay? And that's different from early stage business development. Okay? And um, I'll get into a little more detail about that. So, um, and then, then you hear people saying numbers like 6% of VC um, uh, uh, investments work out for them. And some of the VCs say, yeah, no, we like it that way because we want to focus on just a couple. Well, whatever. I mean, these guys that they're already celebrating for already having some succeeded somewhat, they're like putting down the drain again? I mean, it's really upsetting to me to watch, to watch all that happen. And the way it's upsetting to me is that I, I've watched some of the smartest people that I've known the longest in this valley go through startup after startup after startup. It's three years, it's eight years, right? <laughs> they, they, they get so far along, they get their like, you know, team together, everybody's kicking ass, they're all working 90 hours a week, and then it doesn't happen. And, and so I, I think we really want to figure out a way for people that want to be entrepreneurs to learn better how to be an entrepreneur quickly, easily, try it out, succeed, and, and if not succeed, try again. And, and I'm thinking in terms of months, not years. So I've got a, um, I've got a uh, uh, statement that early stage is rarely managed by serious business technical, technical talent. And the way I'm going to talk about that is I'm going to give you a list of ways that um, different, um, <clears throat> that early stage uh, investment happen. Okay. The most common thing that happens when you have an idea is that you have to prototype it, right? Before you can communicate to anybody, you have to do something, right? And, you know, that list I had earlier. So you make a prototype or a mock-up or a paper or, and you get your mom to help you. So if you have your mom, your brother, your friend, your sister fund you, is that due diligence? No, it's love, okay? And love is a very different thing for deciding on whether something's technically plausible than other things. And you, saw, you see a lot of people, I mean, I'm just especially thinking about, one time I gave a keynote at some invention um, celebration in Hong Kong, and they had these guys from, from like, you know, from nowhere, who had, their whole town had, had brought the money together for them to get their prototype together to make their invention, to get their patent, and come to this big celebration in Hong Kong. Oh my gosh, you know, missing teeth, everything, not wearing clothes of any sort, basically. And you know what? I mean, one of them was Parallax. Okay? The guy had invented Parallax, you know, for, for, for advertising. I mean, I saw it on posters driving to this arena, you know, and they, you know, they'd spent, you know, every resource they could get their hands on. Consultancy, that's a much more honest way of of investing in, in, in uh, technology. Um, the basically, you, you know, you have some skill, you go out and you say, hey, I can do something. People, uh, people pay you for it, and it's kind of a short-term return is, there, is your test. It's very honest, it's very honorable. Uh, a way that you can kind of make a real business out of consultancy is organic growth, you know, and if you take a look at land or, or HP, that's what they did, right? Land kind of they, they got consultancies, they got more consultancies, they got they had four or five ideas. It turns out, you know, a couple, you know, the, the, the polarizing film worked, all the other ones we don't remember. And then finally he got to reinvent another thing when, you know, a few years later. Um, organic growth, you have to have contiguous short term successes. Angel investment, I'm sorry, it's just like mom with love. Okay. You walk in with a suit, he loves you, he pays, he gives you a little bit of money, takes thirty percent of the business and gives you a hundred thousand dollars. 
That's a nice thing to do. But um, it, it isn't clear that angels, I mean, it's not, you know, some of them get dive right way in. I know angels that go and, you know, embed themselves in the country, uh, company, you know, Gordon Bell. I mean, a lot, 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 lot of them can be other things. But I, I think this comfort thing is a confusing way to make a decision. Venture uh, fund investment. Uh, so uh, venture capitalists, the way I, way I phrased it earlier, I will rephrase as you, they're looking for a turnkey company. Right? They want the thing just to be able to, you put in money and boom, it goes. And um, uh, what that really is, is that they, uh, they're prepared to manage the financial and management issues. And they, they're very proud of you know, getting good people into the management positions and making sure that everyone's being organized and, and deliberative and everything. What I find sad is that a lot of times VC people tell me stories of guys that have been funded all the way, you know, three rounds of funding, and then they find out the technology didn't work. You know, how can that be, right? Who's pulling, I, I, you know, I mean, it's a very depressing thing. Competitions, I hate competitions. Okay, they're doing well now, but competition is the idea that first you go driving across the, the desert, and then they give you the X prize, right? So where did the money come from for you to get your little vehicle together to do that? I guess it's mom again, right? Mom does a lot of... Who's the government? Well, the government did not want to and did not say they were going to fund uh, um, uh, their, their, their grand challenges and things. However, when uh, Rod, Rod Brooks, um, went, when they came to him and said, why aren't you doing a grand challenge? He says, look, I'm, I'm making robots that people pay me money for. Why should I be doing this? And they said, well, we'll give you some money. And then they started doing it. But they, they literally pretended they weren't going to. And it is starting to change, and that's a good story that now people are thinking of funding people to, to get the prepare to do a competition, as opposed to the competition uh, being that you, that you have succeeded and then you get paid, which is what, what competitions typically have been. Funded university research, I have another cynical statement. I've been a professor. I was here, an adjunct for eight years, and then I, uh, MIT for 10. Um, look, the way you've got to do stuff to be at a university is you've got to be known. You've got to be known for your great work. And your great work is an extension of the work you started off as a student. You know, I was telling, why you guys said, why about that user interface and AI thing he was talking about at the minute? Why do you have that funny story where he just wants to make stuff? Well, because I've been working on AI and, and, and user interface since I was a graduate student. And it, you know, it makes it seem like a line of work and it's a field and everything. But the danger is that if things aren't on the track of you getting tenure, you don't work on them. And it makes things conservative. It's not a way to get innovation. That, that's, that's, the, that's the fallacy. That's the surprise for me about, about universities. And also, the environment, the collegial environment, is not as good as at the, at the, at the research labs, the industrial research labs, where people do actually share ideas and expertise and, and team up and be parts of groups. At universities, they very much more are, 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 have to be focused on their own, their own survival. Government investment in small businesses. I, I went and talked to the guy that runs that, that business for NSF uh, a few months ago. And what's really depressing is how many of those SBIR grants go to people that have gotten several. Great. I've just got a security violation from, from uh, Google, of all things. That's really interesting. Uh, OK. Wow, that's. Yeah, that's new. Uh, oh, but this is luckily not changed. OK, we'll just pretend that that thing doesn't. Huh, I've got a different screen than you have. It's all right. Um, <clears throat> the, um, uh, so so there's, comp there's, there's people that basically churn out SBIR grants. And the successes of SBIR-funded companies is shockingly low. Um, they, they point to some that succeeded you know, half a decade, a decade later. They aren't the kind of stories you'd expect of, of, of they gave, they, they got the little, they got them over the hump and then they did well. Um, the, um, okay, the internal company spinoff, that, that's basically, you know, uh, last ditch for sunk costs. IBM made a company that, that installs robotically uh, knees. Um, you know, they were playing with robotics and they did such a great job of it. God, that could be a company. And the guy that loved it was the vice president of research. So they made a company. Now, Robo, it's called Robo Knee or something, Robo something. And uh, Robo, I don't know. And, you know, they make, you know, a few million dollars a year. 
And so what, what a distraction for a company that's, that's, that's focusing itself on $100 million, billion dollar bets to be making a, you know, a couple million dollar a year high tech company. Because in fact, you know, the, the, it, it's what you do in, if, you, if you lose, right? You really don't want your resources to go into that unless you have a model of starting companies that make them become big. And that's what an incubator is. Um, and an incubator, where is incubator? Ah, incubator. What you do if you're an incubator, um, Nolan Bushnell, who made Catalyst in the 80s, told me this story. In fact, his wife told me this story. In a very uncomfortable dinner, she said, um, <clears throat> uh, basically, the good ones leave you, and you're left stewing and festering with the ones that need help. And so what happens is that whoever's running the incubator is, in some sense, responsible for all these little babies. And they're like making sure their diapers are changed and everything. What? Orphans. Yeah, yeah. And, and they find themselves as orphans. And so when you try to meet with Bill Gross, which I've tried, and he likes to, wants to get together with me too, he says, you know, every time I talk to his secretary, well, he's got five board meetings in the next two days because he's, he's, he's sitting there, bandwidth limited, involved in that deep way. And what I'm especially concerned about is once you have that much power, how can you make the best decision every time? And if you look at, at Ideal Labs, it's a fabulous guy, fabulous company, fabulous blah, blah, blah. Their, their, their home runs are not as big as the fabulousness of the people and, and the organization. And that's, that's unfortunate, you know, uh, because, you know, they are great people and it is a great organization. So let's see what happens. Does that take us forward? Now, why am I? Ah, good. OK, so we're going to talk about uh, the, um, oh, one more thing I want to say about that is here's kind of a table where I kind of, you know, thought about what, what these different uh, investment strategies are and, and, and how, how well they do various things. And, and the one that I haven't talked about it does much better than the other ones. Um, and uh, uh, let, me, let me talk about Generator Fund, uh, which I call excubate.com. Uh, <clears throat> so um, uh, we've already talked about that. Um, so the idea is that, that um, I'm going to go to the next one, actually. The idea is that um, I've always run invention shops. I ran one at IBM that did about 40 prototypes a year, about that many patents and papers, and, and about two to three product introductions a year. So I was very frustrated with the 38 or 36 or something that didn't go anywhere. Um, so what did I do? I built IP. I tried out, you know, brand new areas. I tested ideas for performance. I tested them for usability. I thought about a business plan. I thought about a go-to-market approach. I went to some vice president. I gave presentations about it, you know, and he'd give me money and it was all great fun. Okay. And then, I already told you what happened, right? The, the ones that were brand new ideas were very, very difficult for the company to, to make a decision to make a new business around. And so what I really would like to do is take those wonderful packaged ideas, and the next time I'm seeing you, I hope that I have the funding, and I've done this to the point where I have one of them in front of you. And I'm going to probably have one of them in front of you every four months. I'm going to give you a demo of it. I love giving demos of things. And I'm going to tell you about how it's built. I'm going to tell you the architecture. I'm going to tell you the business plan. Open, on TV, I don't care. And afterwards, we're going to go back room. And I'm going to find out if you have a little business ability, some technology, you know. Do you have some tech, tech chops? And do you want to make $1,000 a week trying it out? So now what I'm doing is that there are <clears throat> basically um, three major ways that things flop. The team blows up on the launch pad. It always happens. Uh, VCs will tell you that. The technology doesn't work. That you have to test the technology. And the market doesn't work. One of the most important things I learned at IBM was whenever I took a brand new idea to the marketing or planning people, who are the people that you had to go through to get anything to happen, they would say, well, there's nothing to benchmark this against. Nobody's ever done this. We don't know how to evaluate this. And I'd say, yeah, <laughs> right? And, and the way I'd get around it would be something like, I'd leak it to Business Week, and they'd say it's great. 
right? Which is pretty sloppy, to be quite frank. But in fact, that idea of getting some external understanding that it's got some value is where we have to be in order for people to get confidence. And the idea of giving it to like 20 or 30 or 50 kids or people like you, all you kids out there, some of you have, you know, it looks like various levels of maturity here, which is just what I want. I want them to, some people to come in and say, I'm going to show it to my uncle and my brother and my son, and I'm going to go and I'm going to go over to Stanford Shopping Center, and I'm going to go to the cafeteria over on campus, and I'm going to play with this thing. And for, for four weeks, every time you come back to my little organization, we'll talk about a little bit more, every time you come back, I'm going to give you a thousand bucks. And that thousand bucks is, of course, I give you five thousand bucks for the first five weeks for you to test this thing out. And after that, you have to give a presentation. And let's say there's 30 of you guys doing this. We pick kind of eight of them that are really great. And we give them a $50,000 challenge. So that $50,000 challenge, we give you uh, 15 weeks, kind of $3,000 a week. And you are going to make a complete feature set. And you're going to get a schedule together. And you're going to get <clears throat> uh, your team together. And what did we test in that first one? We tested the market. We tested the team. We tested the technology. Okay? And the second one, we're, we're deepening that. Okay? The third competition, after, that, after those 15 weeks, we have your presentation. We have this, uh, we have this, this excuse me, generator board that sits and watches you give this presentation. And, and there's you know, just uh, less than 10 of you now, 10 teams. Maybe some of the teams borrowed some people from the teams that didn't work out. But also remember, the funders of this that I'm going to look for are the companies that want to acquire. And what I actually believe, and we'll get to this later, is this is going to be a tremendous benefit for uh, companies that, that, that are in the position of trying to uh, um, think about what they want to be in the future. And it's going to be cheaper than any other way I think that they can do those four things I was talking about. The, the, <clears throat> the seeing around corners, the, the looking, at, uh, um, uh, looking good to Wall Street, the, uh, getting good people and, and of making new products. So <clears throat> at the end of that one, we're going to pick people again and we're going to give people a year's funding. Why a year's funding? Because we got to sell this to the VCs. And I think the best way to sell it to the VCs is to get a beta product with a customer. And so to get a beta product with a customer, <laughs> You got to harden everything. You got to throw out the one that was done in Python that I made, and the one that it was done in Flash that you made in the second competition. We got to make the one that's in whatever it has to be in, right? For for the real thing, and <clears throat> we got to get you know we have to have the real team, the real schedule, the real channel. That that's that's who you're going to sell it, how you're going to sell it. You know, people there there are some channels that are easier than others. We at Web 2.0, there have been some success, successes where people skip a lot of the having to figure out how to sell things they think, but but you know. Uh, in terms of professionalizing the, the, um, the process of, of early stage uh, um, business technology development, I think the exciting thing is to get a, a funnel of, of, of ideas and products going into the, area, the Silicon Valley that, that let people fail in a month or three months. And what they get is they get their little diploma at the end of that, right? This little diploma says, you know, I did this. And guess what? Those, those, those meetings where they come back, the difference between them coming back to me or coming back to a VC is that the people that they're coming back to are the people that made the prototype in the first place. We built this prototype, and everybody's got that level playing field. And, every, and these guys that are, they're coming back to talk to, they know how this thing was built. They know why they made the trade-offs. And you know what? The people that went out, some of them are going to make things that are much more exciting than we expected. Some are going to make things that are exactly what we expected, and some are going to make things that are not as good as we expected. And when I first uh, taught uh, Lisp and AI here, I uh, had people make this adaptive help system. And it was amazing. I had 60 students, and four teams did things that I never could have imagined. And I learned some things that went into my PhD thesis out of the, the projects. They could have been, in fact, a couple of them could have been products. So if you take a look at this whole system, how long is this whole, this whole, this whole track? It's kind of 18 months, right? It's not, it's, not such a, um, <clears throat> it's not such a long time. And you can say, oh my gosh, you're going out in the open and showing this thing before you've got a company. Well, how could anybody compete with the speed of multiple teams simultaneously trying it with the support of good technical 
uh, 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 mentoring and of, of business leader mentoring. Uh, so the people, basically, you know, Don Norman, Gordon Bell, Vaughn Pratt, you know, everyone I've gone to pretty much says they want to be a mentor, right? And, and so we have the possibility, you know, if this thing's happening, I think that we can have some of the best minds in the world helping these kids understand uh, what, what, um, what, what's wrong with their things. Okay, so that's, um, that's, that's, that's the, the set of challenges. Um, and I was kind of talking about the $5,000, $50,000, $500,000 challenge. And the goal is a profitable, acquirable, VC-fundable uh, uh, organization, or to be acquired by one of the, uh, <clears throat> one of the funders um, that, that, is, um, that is involved with this fund from the beginning anyway. So this is just the stuff I've been saying. And so then the question is, what's the value proposition? Uh, how do you, how do, how's this thing, how do these things make money? How does the, how does somebody funding it uh, make fund money? Uh, money? And, <clears throat> um, you know, what we want to do is um, <clears throat> basically, um, you know, access relevant world-class people uh, and their innovations, uh, help, help companies that are, that are that are funding it with, um, you know, technology forecasting, business success through um, these generated companies, um, and the use of uh, generator IP and hiring contestants. So if you're a company investing in this thing, the fact is that when I was at IBM, those three, you know, three products we made a year, they made billions of dollars. I mean, I can go and tell you about them. They, they made lots and lots of money. So it wasn't a little thing that those, were, that those were coming up. But they weren't things that you would, I, I wouldn't have anyway, thought were my big ideas. My big bets were not going out that way. So I believe that in the invention process, there's going to be, let's say we have three companies, four companies. That's all I really hope for, to be funders. Um, could be VCs, could be companies, could be hedge funds, could be, could be high net worth individuals. Um, they'll have some dreams, you know, whether it's, one of the people that was thinking of funding me, it was all about medical devices. I said, well, we have to have a couple of other people that are interested in medical devices. You know, a communications company, Nortel, is interested right now. Um, or says they, they basically they're waiting for me to get another couple funders, actually. Um, but uh, they will come with some problems. And it's not that they're going to tell, tell me or us what to do. My experience at MIT working with 60 or 100 Sponsors is, you know, if I did what they told me, I wouldn't help them. But if I ignored what they were interested in, I wouldn't have, have quite the, the uh, inventiveness. Just to give you an example, MasterCard was playing around with, uh, you know, smart cards with physical security. And they had uh, this, you know, trying to figure out, could they put a battery in the smart card and have a finger detector? I mean, I turn off the finger detector even in this big mama because it's not very reliable. So I told, you know, gosh, I said, why don't you just shield the card so that they can't be read? Huh, that'll work? So yeah, that'd work. You know, here, here's a paper clip. We can show it. Wow, fantastic. So they thought I was, there was a holy grail had been found. It didn't cost anything. They came back. They said, well, can't you put it in the card? So, you know, we patented a switch in the card to turn it on when you press to activate. And it looks like, I don't know, it's the province of Ontario is thinking of licensing it now. So that's kind of fun. Um, it, it, it's fun because the solution to what they wanted was much simpler than what they were imagining. And, um, and because, you know, turns out that having these active badges in your wallet as you're walking around might be susceptible to some risk uh, that you can't see. So that, that, that would be a, a thing. Anyway, um, so the, the question is, there'll probably be some IP that is rolling off the bottom of this organization that these funders would, would like to uh, get involved with. Um, and then I, I kind of see it this way, that uh, let's say that the, um, uh, <clears throat> the generator keeps kind of 24% of whatever company is being built, and the, the funders, they get 24, 25% of whatever company is being built, and, and then we save kind of 24, 25% for, the, for these guys, these kids that came backstage, right? 
that they're going to own a quarter of the company after all of this has happened. And then, the, and then we leave another quarter for whoever's going to invest in it for the next stage. What, what, what's interesting is if you look at that model, that's, everyone gets a big chunk without having to think about all the dilution phases that we go through before <laughs> normally we go to what that next investment will be. Because we've already invested, you know, you know, more than a half a million bucks. The next stage is going to be the three to five million, and they're still going to have a quarter, which is more than a lot of VC, a lot of entrepreneurs. What I think is really one of the sad things today is that when you are an entrepreneur and you've got the idea, the energy, and the technology, the business ideas, you've got the team together, you've, you've put your neck on the line, what do you end up with? 8% of the company? Well, you think you have a whole bunch of it, and then they, take, they, give, you know, they, they keep taking pieces and pieces and pieces. They're, they know the negotiation story. They know how to take it away from you. And I just don't think that's right. I think that you, end up, you, you end up with um, frustrated people, right? Why are we making frustrated people when, we, when, we're, when these are the people that are making what, what the National Academy of Sciences says is 80% of the growth of, 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 of the American co economy? 80% of the growth of the American economy over the last 100 years is attributed to technology. And here we are, you know, zipping them out of everything and giving it to the bankers, which we know bankers do a great job with their money. Um, so that's, that's what I'm dreaming of, is getting, getting uh, three, three of you guys to join uh, Nortel and putting two to four million dollars investment a year. And, um, <clears throat> and then making, making this, this thing where we end up um, one, one of the other things that's interesting about this, this competition, this phased competition thing, is as you can see, first of all, I'm not committing to any particular technology to begin with. I'm trying out lots of them, and we're making 20, 30, 40, and we're picking four. And I'm not committing to any of those first stage explorers. I'm giving them experience, I'm giving them training, but I'm, not, I'm, I'm delaying commitment while funding them. So, as opposed to pretending that we're committing to people, those lovely meetings where nothing really happens, and then not funding them. I'm funding them, and, then I'm get, and, 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 not, and, and the commitment's delayed. And then the commitment's delayed also to the business. So at any point, this thing can be stopped, right? This little train, this, this one of four that comes out a year, it can be stopped. And so what we're doing is we're delaying commitment, and we're uh, allowing as much flexibility as possible so that we're giving ourselves as many opportunities for success as possible. So, uh, yeah, and the inventor, whoever the inventor is, they're going to get one, two, three percent. You know, that's kind of what inventors get. I'm an inventor, never got that yet. But anyway, that's what they supposedly get. And, and what you end up with there is this, this, this model where, <clears throat> as, what, what are we going to prototype on? We're going to have a little, we're going to have a team, okay? Let's see what the team is. And we're going to have these inventor business leaders, okay? And this is how much the thing is going to cost. It's going to cost kind of that much a year to run the thing. And, <clears throat> and, and the idea is that, you know, there's this, this, this generator board, and they sit and lay, think about ideas. And, you know, I got 120 ideas sitting on this disk. Please don't borrow my, my, my computer, um, which I'd like to put into this thing. But I don't expect that there are going to be the ideas we start with. We might start with some of them. We might start with some that the company brings. We might start with some that somebody out from the outside brings in. And then we're going to, then we, then, then we prototype lots of things, more than we're going to use. And we, we test them in this way. Why do I make this list of the people? Well, I really believe that without a prototyping team, I don't have the chance of giving the would-be entrepreneur from Stanford what he needs. Okay, what I believe is, is missing um, for, for, um, for so many of us is that <clears throat> we start off as a graduate student in, business, in, in, uh, in the business school. Maybe we even have an undergraduate in, in engineering. So we got, so we got, so we took about three or four classes in business. We took, took about five or six classes in engineering. And we went to Fry's a few times to find out about market, right? So I think that, you know, people's t idea of team is they had some friends on their dorm, right, in their dorm room, uh, their dorm hall. And their idea of technology is the few classes they took. And their idea of, uh, <clears throat> of, um, of, of, uh, <laughs> of market is, is, is basically, you know, the business section of, of, of San Jose Mercury News. You, you got to do better than that to really be a success. And that's why I want to bring uh, the idea ready to work with to people. Now, people say, oh my gosh, why would I work with somebody else's idea? I've got a perfectly good social networking idea. Right? Why did they work on social networking? Well, because that's what's hot right now. Right? It's not their idea. It's what's in the air. So a lot of, a lot of when people think is their idea, 
is basically them saying they want to be in control. That's great. We want them to be in control. In fact, we don't want them in our building. We want these organizations to be in other people's garages and, and them to be building it and them to own it. Why? Because I don't want to spend all my time on those board meetings. Yeah, maybe I'll be involved somewhat, but the point is I'm going to have these mentors, I'm going to have these other people, and the idea is that these people are going to own their business, and that's what's going to take them forward. This is kind of how much it costs to run the thing. You know, I run, uh, the first year uh, we run four competitions at the, th at the, at the, uh, uh, the top row is the um, $5,000 level, the second row up there is the $50,000 level, and the third row is the, 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 the half a million dollar level. And so we're just kind of, you know, as you start up a bunch of these things, how's it going to, how's it going to end up costing? And not that that's a very interesting slide, but it's kind of just got to keep thinking about all of the aspects of it. So I, I, I have this, this, this expectation that, that these, you know, three to five uh, um, uh, companies will com commit for uh, three years and they're going to uh, each make kind of 10, 10 times their, their uh, um, investment. And, and uh, you know, it seems ridiculous to, 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 to look at it and say, gosh, how can, you, how can you expect that you're going to get these companies that are going to be valued at $100 million a piece? And I just know that we've eliminated an awful lot of the things that go wrong in normal startups, right? By, 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 by really allowing ourselves to make sure that things are tested and making sure lots of different ways our, our, our avenues are tested for, for going forward and, and, uh, and focusing on people looking at other, other people that might be succeeding instead of them as opposed to just looking at mom who isn't giving them enough uh, money. Um, so that's, that's, that's what I believe about it. Um, and uh, then the people will say, uh, they'll say, well, gosh, how... How could you find these people? How will you find all these great entrepreneurs? And you know, all I have to say is that uh, I, I haven't had trouble getting people to be interested in the ideas I have when I have them. Um, and that's been a lot of fun, you know, going on uh, these various shows and talking about smart spoons and smart cars and, you know, dish makers and all of the things that I've made. Um, and, and then um, there's a lot of uh, people <laughs> in the valley that, that really cycle. Uh, there's an awful lot of people that got laid off when, you know, a thousand people was famously laid off by Yahoo in March. And, and, <clears throat> and there's an awful lot of people that come to Silicon Valley because they want to get involved in, in new ideas and new, ide uh, new company creation. And there's also a lot of people that come to Stanford because Stanford is the entrepreneurial university. And that's really, I think, what Hennessy's trying to do with this place. He's infusing this place with the D school and with classes like this with the dream of and the interest in making uh, an organization that, that generates company after company after company. And it's just amazing how this valley and this school have done better than everybody else. I mean, I, I, I really thought that MIT was going to be like Stanford. I've been at Stanford for a long time. I, I actually gave, I, when I was at IBM, I had the honor of giving um, Larry Page and Sergey Brin a SIR grant uh, in 1996 or seven for a million dollars worth of disk drives. They were, they were students here and it seemed like they had a good idea and we gave out grants to universities. And so, you know, and so Hector, uh, you know, Garcia Molina and Terry Winograd and I and a bunch of people sat around a table and, you know, okay, we gave them a, by the way, a million dollars, it bought a two thirds of a terabyte. Ooh. Right. So that, that's, what, that's what they got with that big money. But anyway, the point being that there's a lot of people cheering, cheering people on in this valley, and it really does, things do happen. Um, you know, and I've watched a lot of companies come out of this department and out of this university, and it's very exciting. So I think that there's not going to be that hard to find interested people in, in, in it. And I'm also excited because I think that um, it really fills a gap, an educational gap that is lurching between the engineering uh, world and the business world, between the business, <laughs> business uh, school world and, 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 and real business. I'm, I, right now I'm working with a fresh MBA graduate um, who is terrified of getting involved with this because, in fact, it, 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 you know, that person's concerned that if they went into a normal business environment, they've gone to all these classes and they've got this credential, you know, they should use it and go and, and show that they can get a job at Booz Allen or something. And I think that that's how it feels. You, you spend all your life trying to get these credentials, and then you have to show that the credential was valuable. 
Just start a startup. You don't need a credential for that. So it's very hard. And what I found at MIT is that even the kids that, that, that went through business classes, that went through you know, I, master's degrees, with, I, there was one who said, I want to be an entrepreneur. I gave him a product idea right before he started his master's degree. We, he worked on it the entire time. It was fantastic. It was tested. There were companies interested. Everything was great. He'd taken four classes at the business school. He'd had a startup that he was involved with before, and he did not have the guts to go forward. I put him in front of a VC and two angels, and he, he didn't even realize that he was supposed to be pitching me at this company. I mean, it's just amazing how these things are very difficult. And bridging that gap of wanting to be an entrepreneur and being an entrepreneur, I think that we can really help with by, 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 the, by, by seeding it with all of the ingredients that are, that are um, valuable. Um, what is this? I'm, okay, so um, why would, why would um, people invest in it? Well, uh, large companies, there's a lot of large companies out there that aren't, the, that aren't Google, that have a hard time getting great people, that have a hard time really forecasting the best technology, get a hard time getting the best deals for, for, for buying or, or acquiring that technology. And those companies often even have some idea of where they want to go. And those are the people that I think are really exciting because they can, they can, they can direct this a little bit. It, it's not a big investment. A couple million bucks is a very low investment compared to building a research laboratory. And in a way, by, by um, making something that's kind of semi-permeable where they only have to invest um, to, to learn about these things and maybe to hire some of the people that don't work out as entrepreneurs but look like they're really good engineers, um, gives them, I mean, hiring good people, recruiting is very difficult. I guess there's a tent across the street where they're giving out food. If you'll uh, even look at, there's, there's a day for job recruiting. Um, uh, so uh, that's that. And then finally, of course, you know, everyone would like to get the best deals. And, in, you know, and Intel Ventures say they do. But everyone else says they don't. So that's, that's another thing. Um, I also think that, um, uh, that it really, um, uh, there's an awful lot of VCs that don't get the same deals that, Kleiner Perkins and, and Sequoia find themselves in the position to look at. And the, the, for those people, it's kind, of a, it's kind of fun, too. And uh, one, one VC actually told me that he thought that I should go to uh, uh, the Carlyles of the world because they need, to, they need to see where technology is going, and this is chump change for them. I, I don't know. But uh, anyway, so um, I could talk about a lot of my, the technology I've built and the ideas that I'm dreaming of taking forward. I've, I've given little bits of that. But um, um, here are some of the things I've made over the last few years at, at, at MIT. And, and um, you know, um, here's some of the ones that uh, landed me uh, laying, on, laying on a bed on, on, in Broadway. I, I got to uh, be on Good Morning America with my smart bed once. But I think that the thing to do right now, instead of talking about uh, laying down, is, is just to, uh, you know, we have another 10 minutes. And I really think it, I owe it to you guys, to, for you guys to, uh, to ask me some questions or comment, yes. I have the impression that something like 90% of human effort goes into trying to prevent other people from succeeding because of the threat of various kinds or jealousies or things like that. How can you protect against that sort of sabotage when you do everything in the open? Sabotage. <laughs> um, you know, there's no alternative. That's the answer. Um, the fact is that what can they do? Go find all of these kids and blow up their garages? Um, do something better? They can try to do something better. Okay? That's, a good, that's a good kind of sabotage. Um, or they can try to make the standards committees make it impossible or illegal. That's another kind of thing they can do. I mean, there's all these, you know, that, that kind of warfare always exists. I am not convinced that keeping secret has saved anybody's butt at getting things to to really be uh, great products um, and, and do better. I, I know that there are people like Steve Jobs that actually do have a model of secrecy for, for, for marketing reasons. And, and he, he, he's a counterexample to that. But my, my experience was that um, that pointing device sat in the closet until I got Business Week to talk about it. And, that, and, and, and even then, I couldn't get the engineers to look at it until I took it to inter, uh, Interact ni uh, 90. And, and had everyone gathered around looking at it and terrified all the lawyers at IBM. My experience is the only success is, is doing it. And that patents don't help. 
Um, the only thing that helps is doing it and speed and and uh, and I think the idea of having multiple people working on things is is um, is, is a way to make them go faster as opposed to having bigger teams. Right? Big teams have a problem of coordination. Uh, competition has a has a different kind of a, a, a thing. That's that's. I don't know if you buy it, but that's that's what I believe right now, and I'd be delighted to think about it more deeply if you if you think I'm missing something. Yes. What you're describing really is a new kind of business in incubator with an onboard firing squad, <laughs> um, and that Tons you, you intend to kill off a lot of projects fairly early. I'm going to kill off projects, but also I expect that one of the problems is the wrong people are running the wrong project, and that people. His enthusiasm might not be sustainable. And so the real, the real trick, I think, is getting people to the level of enthusiasm and, and energy on anything they do so that they succeed. So that's, that's, that's I think, I, yes is the answer. <laughs> There's something about a firing squad. Yeah, the other thing, though, is that you can let somebody who's just good at prototyping just stay in first stage, stay in first stage, and just pop things out, and somebody else is good at whatever. So they don't, you don't have to have an organization that does the whole thing. And if they get jealous of the other guys? They can jump over and be one of the comp competitions. I don't mind that they've got an unfair advantage because they made the first prototype. It might be an unfair disadvantage, by the way, that they How are stuck. What about the other guys? You're going to have them on separate places, all over the places. You're not bringing them into one, one space so they interact. No, no, no. The prototyping, the prototyping group, the eight prototypers, they're all, they're all in my little, we got a little, we got a big room. We got, they got offices there. They're all, they're all interacting. They're all playing. That first prototyping stage where we're just trying out the idea and just getting a, a little a, one that works and, and trying it for usability and everything before we do a competition, we do that. Once we have something we know is okay, then we open it up to the competition. Those guys go off with with this prototype. All of them having the same starting starting uh, uh, kit. Is that confusing to you? I'm trying to think how the dynamics of this are going to going to work out in practice. Yeah, I'm trying to. <laughs> Yeah, um, CS first. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, you mentioned that most investors like to fund products that have been beta tested by a customer. So I'm curious about your internal competition model and how do you test for the viability of demand in the marketplace? Well, um, there are various ways to test for viability. Um, and, um, you know, I, I've been around these marketing and planning organizations a bit. And I always find it just funny that they are um, all organized with their, with their principles and their approaches so that they do things that I see as looking in the rearview mirror. And uh, so I, I really, uh, as an inventor, I'm, I'm looking for problems that haven't been solved. And uh, that is what the world's going to become, is the solutions to things that haven't been solved. You know, they will finally be solved. So um, uh, how do you size the value? You can size them in terms of how big of a problem you have and what the consequence of really solving it would be. Uh, can you predict whether people will have, up it'll have uptake? Well, you can, you can diminish the risk by seeing that it doesn't require everything else to fall into place. Just to give you an example, I had a, a, a wonderful product idea for the ThinkPad, which was a leash. Okay. The idea was at that time there was a lot of people going through the metal detectors at the airports, <clears throat> and they, if you put your laptop in, they, they, if you put your laptop in first, there's a, they, they, there was this little scam where people would get, they'd, they'd wait till somebody put in the laptop, they'd get in line, they, one person would hold up the line while the other person took the laptop, and before this guy got through, the laptop was gone. Yeah. Okay. So that happened for a while. Uh, a little complicated. What, what, what's going on now? I'm not so sure. But anyway, to the tune of, um, oh, you know, close to 100,000 laptops a year. Okay. Big, big number back then. Yeah, I think it's over. But we got worse things to be worried about. Um, but anyway, so I wanted to make this leash. I'd made everything about it. And they said, well, but Bluetooth is coming. Okay. Who can guess what year that was? Bluetooth was going to be here in six months. That's the reason we trashed a product that could have made a gigantic amount of money. It was 1997. Okay. And I was just listening to a lecture today. We're saying, oh, this is the year when, when Bluetooth is starting to happen. <laughs> okay. So, you know, um, just, okay. Uh, another question? Yeah. Uh, it, it's sort of like a, a game theory model that you have. You have sort of an internal game 
and you have these groups that are competing to get to be some sort of finalist where there's a possibility of getting more money and then getting to market. So, you know, in California, the law is such that you can't, as you can in Massachusetts, have a non-competition agreement that's going to work. California has a strong public policy saying non-competition agreements are per se invalid. So when you have bullets that say, look, we're going to make sure that the result is the people who don't get to the next stage don't go to Klein or Perkins and say, look, we've got enough knowledge of what to do here. Put another $10 million into the little venture that we have. The team is here. We got discarded in this competition. But with $10 million from you and some management talent, we can trump these guys that are at the last stage. You got to start thinking of how that gaming plays out. Because yeah. But who owns the IP? Well, it's the IP just, was created before we started the competition. It's not just the IP. It's your point that the patents that are on file yeah, yeah. aren't going to get issued for a while, and there's a, there's a race. Sure. So let's pretend we're in the business now of creating the next best widget. Yep. And that group who was inspired, right yeah, that group who was inspired gets knocked out of the competition. Right. There are all these VCs around looking and saying, wait a minute, those guys were pretty good, and if we plug in you know, Steve Jobs type person as the CEO with 10 or $100 million worth of venture capital, we could just wipe out. What are you going to do about that problem? Let me suggest that you that actually happen. want that to happen. Well, let's, you, and then you, you, you that's do. what I want to know. Are you okay with that? Because you're not going to get the returns then because the result was the VC who punched well, in the they, additional money. Yeah, I'm not sure the losers are going to do better than the, than the winners. I'm also not sure that they, they're going to do very well Given that they they did they did have a contract about about what the value what what who owned what in this process and maybe they don't have to maybe they don't have to uh, honor their their contracts but um, you know people do uh, make make uh, make make commitments about about what what they're going to do based on things they're getting paid for and so they're getting paid to do something they're getting paid to be part of something and the and the ownership of the of the thing is in the organization that is paying them. And that organization, by the way, is not the generator, it's the business that's being created. So that, that, that the ship leaves the generator fund and becomes this entity. And that, they, that, their, that their prototype didn't get chosen was because it wasn't as good. And so if Kleino wants to be jerks, they can go try to be jerks. And we can get our lawyers, and they can get their lawyers, and we can all play around. And in the end, you know, uh, whatever happens, happens. And uh, I'm certainly not going to knock it off the starting block because there's jerks in the world. I'm gonna get. I'm gonna. I'm gonna do what I can to protect things, and I'm gonna. And I'm gonna go forward with the best people. No, I think what you have to actually do to solve this problem is I think what you have to say is on everyone that falls out, there's some sort of right or first refusal of the fund to sort of trump anyone else that's coming in to reactivate it. So it comes back in in some form for some future derivative. Uh, certainly, the people that are succeeding are the ones I'm caring most about, and they're succeeding, and that's the reason that I'm. That I'm, that I'm putting my energy into them. And there are con we, have, we have in mind a lot of things that, that maybe you're thinking about. You might have better ideas, and I'd be delighted to talk to you more about it and think about it. You have a question? Yeah, wouldn't that be a great problem to have if you have so many great ideas coming out of this thing, the KP stealing them? I mean, has that ever happened before? I mean, that be a wonderful it may, it might have, but I, I, I'd love to be part of that process, yes. And if KP is, is funding co competitions, that means you get, to, you, you get Sequoia or some of the second or yeah. third rate yeah. people saying, yeah. Yeah. Ah, we want that too. So your price just went up. Yeah, I think that's All it. your exits go up the second, the second somebody the steals price. it. So, so I think the professionalizing the, the early stage uh, <clears throat> um, technology business is, is, is a worthy goal. And I think it could probably net you know, quadruple or, or so of the, the, the value of, of, of starting companies. And hopefully, um, give give entrepreneurs and and uh, of various sorts much more uh, chance to be successful. Um, is there one last question? I've noticed we're just at our. our you've already asked a question, yeah. so I so I wanted to see. Is there anybody else? And if not, you can ask a question. But, um, there any? Yes. Um, so maybe I didn't understand something, but uh, so the generator uh, owns twenty five percent of the company, and the generator is. Uh, stage where you get five k dollars for five weeks. Yeah, the, it gives it gives. The generator is an organization that makes prototypes and runs competitions. And in, those pro in the process of making the prototypes, 
and choosing which things it's going to do competitions for, it does a bunch of mentoring. For a $5,000 competition for an idea, it takes the same idea to a $50,000 competition, takes that same idea to a $500,000 competition. And in that process, tries to mature it to the point the Kleiner wants to steal it. And in fact, we let steal, Kleiner steal it for a big piece of the action. So that's, that's basically the idea. Yes? In the subsequent stages when the teams win the whatever, uh, at, at each stage. We also give them plaques. And you, yeah, no, 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 and you <laughs> refine your ideas. Do you involve them in the patent? Uh, oh, you? we did all the refining and got the patents we wanted before. By the time they're out there building their patents, those patents belong to that organization that is that company. And as that organization forms itself into the final team, it will own that IP. And of course, we have a piece of the action, and the funders have a piece of the action, and the future. But it has to be something I I of itself. If the thing fails, or we blow it up, and we say, "Hey, it's no good at all," we we grab all the IP back into the you know into generator, and then then it festers and doesn't do anything like all the other patents in the world. But I mean, are we are we are we pass it on to our funders or what we, whatever we can do with it? But that's not that's not the dream. The dream is for it really to turn into something. Yes. What fractional ideas fit into this? Funding model? I mean, you, you mentioned a million dollars to Google to sort of... Oh, that was fun. Yeah, but that was, that was, that, I mean, that was... I, I, say your question again. I somehow missed it. Well, I, I, I'm just wondering how many good ideas aren't going to fit in here just because they need too much cash at some stage. Oh, right? I, 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 that, that, that's, um, let's see. I, um, in my little list of 120 that I've put together, um, somewhere in, on, the, on the order of 20 to 30, I have prototypes laying around for. So I'm pretty convinced uh, that there's plenty of things that are sized reasonably to get a long ways with this. Some things I think might take less than I'm talking about. But basically, the point of, of supporting some people to work on something is the most expensive part of almost anything. It's not, I mean, you know, for example, I, I just uh, been working on we, um, a, a technology for a um, multi-touch display that I'm designing. And, um, uh, you know, the patent attorney was upset with my idea. So, sheesh, I'm not at MIT anymore. What the heck do I do? Well, what I did is I turned on my oscilloscope. And I got two liquid crystal displays, and I tested my idea in, two, in, in the two different realms. And after an hour and a half, I'd actually, it took me two weeks to believe I could do it, but then I did it, and it worked, and I was able to figure out that, you know, get, overcome his, his concern. Now, am I in a position to make a fab? No. But some of these experiments uh, are, are easier than you think, and not all of them, but certainly big scale. You know, if, if, my, if the idea is, I will make a DSP. No, I, I, you know, I don't got 100. We're not going to fund 100 engineers to go out and fight, you know, TI or something. But um, if you know, if you if you're making a technology today, these fabs exist. There's so many different uh, technologies that would fit into this, and I, I hope I hope uh, you don't catch me up. I mean, certainly uh, an example of something that wouldn't fit in here very well, and I'd love to do. I'd love to make a new kind of a car. Okay, so what the heck am I going to do? A concept car costs, a, costs one to three million dollars to make. So is that going to fit into this? I, I think that's that's the kind of point you're making. You know, is that making a concept car isn't going to happen with through that through this particular mechanism. Oh well, yeah. Web 2.0 is kind of big too. Okay, is uh, any uh, parting shot? Well, well, we've lost the tape people, so. Oh, they've the left us. The remote people. And then, For more, please visit us at stanford.edu.